Podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Listeners, welcome and welcome back to this new episode of the Thoth Hermes podcast, coming to you on August 31st, 2017. Thoth Hermes is a podcast about all kinds of different points of view and aspects of the Western esoteric tradition. The typical episode is built around a featured guest who will talk to us in a lengthy interview about his life, work, points of view and visions. But you will also find news, reviews and other items and, very important, some pieces of music either selected by our guest or, as for example today, to feature a musician whose work is centered around subjects of our esoteric and occult tradition. Next to musicians, I also want to present the work of visual artists. But as this is a bit difficult on an audio podcast, and I'm not yet ready to do a video version of this show, please go to the website www.thoughthermes.com that is T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com and go straight to the arts page to find our featured artist and his or her work. At the moment, this is Madeline von Förster, and you will be amazed by her paintings, I am sure. And when you have done so, then you can also check out the show notes, where you will find all the links and information regarding this show, the lyrics of today's songs, all the past news items, reviews, etc., etc. Thoth Hermes can be streamed or downloaded from the website, but is also found on Blueberry, Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, Android, and an increasing number of podcast providers who are listing us. I almost forgot. My name is Rudolf. I have the pleasure of being the host of this show, and I produce Thoth Hermes in lovely Austria. It is amazing. It feels to me like I had launched the first episode just last week, but it has been four and a half months ago, and this episode is already our number 10. And I hope you have also already listened to the special episode that came out only four days ago. Our interview guest today is one of the leading figures of the North American pagan and ecology scene. Indeed, he was one of the founders of those movements. Oberon Zell is a legend, and you can imagine that he has a lot to share with us. The music we play today is by famous British singer, songwriter and multi-instrumentalist Dave DeBard. He describes his music as being mystic folk, and I think he, this goes very well with our topic of today. I have had the pleasure to be also able to speak with Dave briefly, so stay tuned and listen also to the short interview where we will talk about his music. And now, some feedback. Well, I have to complain a little here. 
all is well with the reception of this show, I think. We have increasing numbers of downloads every week. This month we beat all previous records in that respect several times, and I'm very grateful for that. Visibly, you guys are spreading the word. Thanks. I also get the occasional encouragement via Facebook or Twitter or email, which is very kind of those who write to me. But I want more. No, seriously, it would really be great to hear more about your ideas, your wishes, and also let me know what you like less, where you would like to see improvement or so. I can't promise that I can fulfill all your wishes, but I will do my best and I promise everyone will get an answer from me at least. I'm also saying this in the perspective that now, with my first podcasting experiences made, I will start over the next couple of months to implement some improvements that I would like to see, both technical and aesthetical, and also content-wise. Maybe vary the format a bit from time to time, etc. And therefore, I would really be interested to hear from you and get your opinion. I won't pester you each time in this section on the podcast, I promise, but please, do help me. And once again, as you know, this is a European podcast, and I like to give a bit the European perspective on our subject, and also let the long-standing European traditions live a bit more. So, it would be great if people from Europe, and also especially a bit closer to my area, would make themselves known to me. I see that I have many listeners in Austria, in Switzerland, Germany, the Czech Republic, etc. And hey guys, you are all close. So it would be really nice to know a bit about you. Needless to say that I am extremely happy about the huge numbers of North American listeners from the US and Canada. You guys make up almost two-thirds of my audience, and I'm so happy and excited about that. There is also so much going on in North America in the field of the Western esoteric tradition, and the presence of so many important American representatives of the field in this podcast is the best proof of that. So, thank you all for being with me today and here, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you as well. You can use the contact form or the voicemail from the website, write to me on Twitter and or Facebook, or just send an email to info at thoughthermes.com. And, by the way, if you know someone in North Dakota who could be interested in the show, do tell them about it. The download statistics of my service provider shows me that I have listeners in each single US state, with the exception of North Dakota. Help me change that. Okay, friends and listeners, you see I'm in a very good mood today. I think, therefore, it is now the perfect time to play our first piece of music for today. As I have said, our featured musician in this episode number 10 is modern-day bard Dave, whose love for spirituality and folk tradition unites in his music. Let's listen together to the song Sabbat, by and with Dave the Bard. I turn my gaze towards the setting sun I taste the incense in the air I hear the sound of the drum The chill of the evening descends All day long I've been working hard for the man But now's the time to ditch this skin and be who I am People just don't understand 
You can keep your devil I'll dance with Pan For I will fly free On the wings of ecstasy And I will dance free To the music of fairy Sabbath I will ride I will dance with the fairy queen beneath the silver moon I will taste the honey mead and chant the witch's room My heart with the pulse of the land Witness now the union of chalice and of blade Of life and death and life again the union is made By power of land and of sea By power of will so mote it be For I will fly free On the wings of ecstasy And I will dance free to the music of fairy In Mark Beltane, Lunasar and Sowey Equinox and Solstice on hilltops in forest tonight To the Sabbath I will rise Is done, the sun will rise upon a brand new day. And I, along with millions, go out to earn our pay. They see just what they want to see. But I have danced with the fairy queen, shed the meat of the sun. I have worn the oaken crown before the horned one. And I'll know it's time to return When I see those pagan fires burn For I will fly free On the wings of ecstasy And I will dance free To the music of fairy And Sowey Equinox and Solstice On hilltops in forest Tonight To the Sabbath I will ride Sabbat, by and with Dave the Bard, from his most recent album bearing the same name. Lyrics and links can be found on the music page of our website. Here comes the interview. We are now all going to meet the Wizard Oz, like he sometimes likes to call himself. No, not the Wizard of Oz, but the Wizard Oz, where Oz, O-Z, stands for his initials. Oberon Zell is one of the most senior and most influential figures of the pagan movement in North America and also beyond. 
In fact, it was him who somehow created the name for this movement, which started in the early 1960s. It has been amazing 50 years, almost to the day, that he founded the Church of All Worlds. In this first part of the interview, he will tell us how it all began, in his childhood, how meeting his fellow Lance Christie became so important for all that followed, and he gives also an interesting insight into the fact how science fiction literature has shaped his ideas and led to the creation of those organizations. Books like Stranger in a Strange Land, not very much known anymore today, should be rediscovered, and the comic novel X-Men, better known still today by the movie series, can be seen in a very different light after this interview with Oberon. Links to find the books he speaks about will be put into the show notes. Oberon also talks about the difference between wizardry and witchcraft and many other interesting topics. So let's wait no longer and start listening to Oberon Zell. Very warm welcome to Oberon Zell. I'm very pleased to have you as a guest today on Thor's Hermit podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Rudolf. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> Oberon, you know my podcast is being produced over here in Europe, and for us Europeans, even though I must say we have very, very many North American listeners, but here in Europe, Oberon Zell is like a kind of a name from the very far west. We have heard about you, we know a bit about you, but... I'm sure we would want to know much more about you today. So let's start from the beginning. Where did you have a first contact with what we would call the other world? Or, well, I also ask you, how would you call it? What were your first contacts? Oh, gosh. I mean, if you're really going to go that far back, it would have to be my birth because I was the um, incarnation of my maternal grandfather. Um, mm -hmm. He he died of a heart attack uh, a year before I was born, and they made his death room into nursery that I awoke in. And to me, it was just a direct continuity of going to sleep one night and waking up the next morning kind of thing. And that sort of introduced me, to, I guess, to it. So I, I had a strong telepathic abilities when I was a kid. I heard before a language became fully developed, I was hearing thoughts and stuff. Eventually, uh, the spoken words took over, but there was a long period where both of them went on simultaneously for several years as a child. I used to go out into the woods and look for fairies and things. I remember finding a junkyard and collecting little bottles and, and trying to make little potions and put them out in hopes that they would uh, somehow attract witches or fairies. I was kind of vague about that. My earliest reading was children's versions of the Greek myths, so that introduced me to the whole world of mythology and, and gods and goddesses and all of that at a very early age. I was somewhere between two and three. So, you know, and, that, and the myths led me into fairy tales, which led me into eventually into fantasy and science fiction, where I kept on with my explorations. Back when I was young, a number of science fiction stories were exploring uh, the possibilities of ESP and psychic phenomena and uh, future evolution of humanity and all that stuff. And some of them were gave practical lessons and teachings that were built in the stories which and I, I got into all this stuff I got into hypnosis found a book on hypnosis and practiced it a lot that was very useful I used to practice uh, psychokinesis on dice and coins till I got really good at it and I could pretty much beat anybody else in games of chance my brother and sister eventually refused to play any of the board games with me because <laughs> I, I just you know always rolled sixes or always got heads when I flipped coins things like that I continued my interest in and um, pursuing all of this stuff. And when I came upon the writings of Robert Heinlein as a youth through his juvenile series, which were coming out right as I was growing into those very ages in the 1950s, 
It would be like the Harry Potter series today if you started it when you were 11 and then just kept getting another one every year. Well, that's what happened to me. I started out reading his juveniles when he first put them out. And every year there was a new one, and every year the protagonist would be a, a little older, and and I always was right there. I identified with that clear up until the final book of the series, one might say, was Stranger in a Strange Land, which came out in 1961, and it changed my life it's a, it addressed all kinds of concepts and myth and magic but it also introduced the concept of organizing a religion that would convey this kind of work and stuff and um so I did. Right, <laughs> we should come back was. to that a bit later on <laughs> sure. because uh, we shouldn't go okay. too fast. <laughs> no, no, that's right. Sorry, I'm way ahead. Of you. <laughs> as you are someone who, as you just said, had that experience from the very, your very birth moment. So for you, this is something which others experience maybe in a different way when they learn about it later on. But for you, it was just life from the very first moment. How did you find out that? Not everyone was like you. Well, that's a, that's a very good question because, you know, when you're little, you just assume that. I, I thought that everybody was talking to each other telepathically all the time, sure. you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I do remember that when I was uh, young, when I would say things, my mother would say, oh, that's just like your grandfather. That's just the, your grandfather always said that. Or you sound like your grandfather. Or your grandfather was interested in that, too, that kind of stuff. And it really turned out to be, you know, quite an amazing phenomena eventually decades later as a much older man my my father confessed to me that he had always felt that i was the incarnation of his um, father-in-law you know All right so um And I had memories. I had really distinct memories of events in many, many years later when I was trying to sort out my own life history and biography. Um, I couldn't quite place when certain of these memories were from. And they, they seemed odd. And so I called up my mother and had a long conversation with her. And she told me that some of the ones that were the strongest in my mind had actually not happened to me in this life at all, but it happened to my grandfather. <laughs> You know, and uh, but to me, they still remain extremely vivid memories that are just the, these little events and things that happened. So, so I have a, a whole different concept of life and continuity, I think, than many people do. But I'm certainly not alone. There's lots of people who have uh, past life memories and psychic experiences. It's it's remarkably common. People just didn't used to talk about it much. Yes, I'm sure. On your website, you call yourself a modern renaissance man, and I like that expression. But can you give your explanation why you use that word and what it is to you? Well, that was a phrase that was coined, I think, initially to refer to Leonardo da Vinci, with whom I've always very closely identified. And it refers to somebody who has simply acquires a wide variety of skills, not just doing a bunch of stuff badly, but but acquiring a variety of skills and learning to do them fairly well, especially in the arts. And I have kind of done that in my life. I've, I've pursued a lot of different areas, and I've gotten to be fairly good as an artist, as a writer, as a sculptor, as a ritualist, as um, you know, a researcher, a teacher, many of these kind of things, and pursued professionally such areas as psychological studies, anthropology, sociology, those areas. And so I think that as I kind of tip my hat to Leonardo da Vinci, and when I was over in Europe a number of years ago in Firenze, uh, Florence, Italy, really, really felt a sense of deja vu. It really was quite a remarkable experience. So, you know, I... If uh, if I can identify rather strongly there, that's that works for me. Yeah, and then in many other interviews which I saw and read, you call yourself a wizard, and I think that's what you are and how you feel. How would you explain that to us? What is that wizard that you are? Well, you know, I think really that's the that's the best word to describe myself. And uh, interestingly, since I've adopted it, a number of other people, I wasn't not by any means the first. It's been a word that's been applied for for ages. It even it's even applied to uh, people who are particularly good at any other skill: science, computer technology, uh, lots of things. Are people are called wizards? You know, yeah. so. 
The term literally means wise one. Wizardry means wisdom, literally, just like philosophy means love of wisdom. So when we find references to wizards, we're assuming that they probably know some stuff and that they probably have insights and experience and depths that are unusual or greater than many. And so people come to uh, for counsel and advice. And that's pretty much the wizard's main job is offering counsel, advice, and mentorship to those who come to one. And you don't really start off calling yourself a wizard. What happens is that other people start calling you a wizard. Yeah. And eventually you kind of accept it. And, and I think it's that way for most wizards. Certainly it has been that way for myself. But we apply it to many figures through history. And I think appropriately, it's, an, it's a noble calling. It's a calling of service. It's a calling of acquiring wisdom that you can then share with others. So, um, you know, in all the wizards of the stories, and there are many, of course, many of the great stories always have the wizard in there to come in and explain things, whether it's Merlin or Gandalf or Obi-Wan Kenobi or Albus Dumbledore, whoever it is, mm -hmm. they kind of start off, the hero meets the wizard and, and kind of gets the rundown of what's going on and what he's got to do. So He's kind of counselor to the Exactly. Hero, right? yeah. The counselor the hero, and counselor to kings as well. That's that's another yeah. one. We have the royal wizards. And I think, um, you know, pr the modern term I think that's closest is probably professor. I, th I think that's, that's very close to what it is. Right. So all of that works for me. And um, it seems to be the most descriptive of what my life is these days. I mean, it's not a secret. You were born in 1942, if I'm right. Right. And I always am amazed when I'm listening to your voice also now, but also in other interviews, I heard how young your voice sound. What's the secret of your <laughs> use, Obran? <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, I've, that's 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 very busy. That comes up a lot. My doctor says the same thing. I think getting laid a lot helps. Um, <laughs> you know, I highly recommend lots of sex. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just don't have time to get old, you know. Um, I just don't. When I was younger, people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd say, very, very old. But I'm still working on it. I, I haven't had a chance to slow down and appreciate that. Although it is nice to get half price tickets to the movies and stuff like that. you know. <laughs> But I must say, I would love to quote you on that. I don't have time to get old. I think that's a very good expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, well, that just came to me there. Yeah. So when you were 20, so many years back, um, you... I think you were at that time already in California, or, or maybe not yet. But not yet, no. Not yet, okay. But that's when you founded that church that you were just mentioning before, the Church of All Worlds, it was called, yep. I believe. When I went off to college in 1961, one of the very first people I met was a guy named Lance Christie. And... And he and I so hit it off. We we were, for each of us, it was our first experience of meeting someone else of the same species as we were, you know. Mm -hmm. We were that that grew up in that kind of an ugly duckling, kind of a changeling sort of an attitude that, that somehow we can't be the natural offspring of our parents because we were just too different. And um, then we and we met each other, and, and it was just a total hit off. Over the years and the decades to follow, he and I be, were very much like Kirk and Spock together of the old Star Trek series. Yeah, me being the Kirk and him being the Spock, and I miss him terribly. He died a few years back. Of, mm. We didn't expect that. We expected we'd keep on going forever and be close. Mm. So we um, were both into science fiction. And that fall in October, Stranger in a Strange Land was the science fiction book club book of the month release. And we both read it over the next few months. We had It, it was in between the lots of other things, so it, it, it took a while. And we felt in our conversations that this really was touching on a lot of the questions and issues that we thought were important. And the perspective of looking at human culture from the outside really helped us a lot at that time to get a handle on just exactly what was going on in the world and where we fit in and what we could do about it. And we, we looked around at the world as it was, and we thought, well, you know, some of these things we could do better, and particularly in the areas of religion and education, which were our respective uh, main focuses. Mm -hmm. And so we both took every course we could find in college and so on in those areas. But on April 7th, 1962, 
when I was um, in my 20th year in Lance II, is that we sat down and shared water, which was the central rite of bonding in Strange and a Strange Land to become water brothers. And we sort of pledged ourselves to dedicating our lives to trying to manifest building a new world. And we, over the months to come and years to come, we shared water with many other people, turned them on to Strange and a Strange Land and built up a kind of a community of water brothers that by the time we graduated in 1965, we had about 100 people. And um, our official mission statement at that time was to make the world safe for people like us. And so we did. We went out and, and did that very thing. An interesting thing about Stranger in a Strange Land that not very many stories have, I can only think of a few, and they're interesting, mm-hmm. is that at the end of the story, it's turned over to the reader. You've become a part of the story. You've become a part of the community of people in the story. And at the end, the community is dispersed to go out and carry it into the world. And as a reader, that's where you find yourself. The other examples of that are the movie Tomorrowland that does the same thing and the great TV series Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which ends by doing the same thing to just turn it over to the reader or the viewer and say, now it's all in your hands. Go forth and do something with it. So that's kind of how it began. And um, for about five years, it was sort of a secret underground water brotherhood that we called ATL, A-T-L, which was the Aztec word for water. And we thought that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And then um, after we graduated, we dispersed to different areas of the country for graduate school and carried on correspondence about, well, should we continue this just being this kind of a secret underground water brotherhood fraternity or should we take it public out into the world because there's probably a lot of other people like us out there who just as we were are looking for their kin for others and so we had a considerable debate about that and we came to the conclusion that we had to do both <laughs> our usual approach to these things. so Lance because of his proclivities was kind of assigned to continue the Atlan Foundation as a uh, underground society which eventually incorporated as the Association for the Tree of Life ATL oh, right. which Lance headed up through his life and, and still continues and you can now it's it's gone public so you can look it up online and stuff and um, I was kind of assigned because of my personality to establish the Church of All Worlds as a public arm of this. And the dating of that was 1967, 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, we opened up our the Church of All Worlds. We first became public by doing a garage sale that we held at a local Beatnik coffee house. And because churches were tax exempt, they got special privileges, including being able to get free advertising on the radio. So we thought that would be pretty cool if we advertised this as a fundraiser for the Church of All Worlds. <laughs> that was the first time we used that term publicly. And afterwards, we, we sold enough stuff to buy what we were looking for, which was a printer that we could be able to use a press so we could print our newsletter. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the owner of the coffee house said, well, a lot of people have been asking us about this Church of Our Worlds. Will you come over Thursday and talk about it? So I said, sure. And that Thursday was September 7th of 1967. And, and I got up there on the little platform in the stool where people would recite poetry and stuff. And, um, and I talked about the Church of All Worlds. And somebody asked, well, what kind of a religion is this? Are you some Eastern sect? Are you some Christian sect? Are you what, what, what are you? Because there was lots of those going on that time. Sure. sure. And I said, uh, well, I guess you could say that we're pagans. And that seems to have been the first time that anybody had used that term as a self-identification. It had always been those pagans in, in a term of, of insult and approbation. Yeah. But I claimed it yeah. proudly. I said, well, I'm a pagan, and, and this is a pagan church that I'm starting here. And that was the seed that eventually spread into a movement that is now estimated at maybe five million people around the world identified. So oh, that's so how say, that. it's still it's still active the church, and I think you're still the the I think the primate it's called of that church, right? 
Oh, yes, the Church of All Worlds is still active, and I'm still primate, and you can look it up online, and we're still doing cool stuff. But in the meantime, the pagan movement has grown hugely, become oh, a yeah. vast, vast thing. And I'm uh, very pleased to have had a, a key role in establishing it by giving it a name. <laughs> yeah, no, that was one of the points I was going to mention, that you are really, I think, in North America, the first person to use that name publicly in that sense and therefore kind of the creator of the what is now called the neo-pagan movement could, could we say like that right yes well that's right to to make a distinction uh with the ancient pagans who we look back to and and hearken to and try to assimilate the wisdom and the teachings and many of the customs and lore But in our modern time, you know, we're not yeah. just trying to recreate the way it was thousands of years ago. We're trying to imagine how it might be if it hadn't been sort of interrupted by things like the Inquisition and stuff. You know? Yeah. It was a bit at the same time as in Europe, the Wiccan movement with Gerald Gardner came into being, one could say. Did you yes. at the time or later have direct contact with Gerald or were you completely a different path? No, we were completely different. We had no idea. We were completely oblivious because all the we knew of witchcraft was in a few books that came over, like uh, Sybil Leake's Diary of a Witch and Justine Glass's um, autobiography and a few of those kind of things. And they all conformed with the popular media mythos, which was that witches were sort of a separate subspecies. Witchcraft was not a religion. It wasn't something you could study with or join. It's something you had to be born with in your blood in your family mm -hmm. and that, that was the mythos that was put out in TV and movies and, and novels and it was also the one that was promoted by people like Sybil Leake and so on uh, none of these folks had any notion of it being something that anybody else could be involved in so we regarded witches pretty much like you know vampires and werewolves and other fairies and other sort of subspecies but yeah. but yeah. you couldn't you couldn't decide to be one Ray Buckland was initiated by Gardner in 1965, and Gardner sent him over to the United States specifically to bring witchcraft to the colonies, as it were. <laughs> and, and he and I met in 1972, I believe it was, or was it? No, 71 it was. And we totally hit it off and became great friends. And that was really my first introduction to modern living witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, that was uh, also involved getting the witches to identify as pagans, which was part of the whole thing. And, and so they became part of the pagan community at that point and also joined the first pagan ecumenical council, which was the Council of Themis that I was a founder of, among among others. So it's, it's really been a marvelous little thing as we've gradually welcomed more and more people into the growing circle. The, you know, the Druids and the witches and the Vikings and, the, you know, uh, all the very many people, the Greeks and Egyptian folks, all becoming identified with the overall category of pagans. Yeah. That's for you the main difference between wizardry and witchcraft. What would you say is the main distinction point? Well, it's very different in, in many ways. For one thing, a wizard isn't a religious functionary, so yeah. witchcraft is presently defined as a religion. It's not a specific practice in the same way that witchcraft is. It varies very much, and there are great wizards of every culture and every uh, religion, whereas witchcraft is more uh, shamanism. It's it's sort of a European term yeah. for shamanism that we find under different terms in, in all tribal cultures. The village witch in the old days, would tend to be a, a widow with her little herb garden and and animals living at the edge of the woods that people would come to, mostly women, would come to for advice and counsel and spells and healings. They usually served as a midwife, but it was a craft. It was a role within the community, like the village blacksmith. And, and that's kind of the traditional view of witchcraft. Now, modern witchcraft has become much more identified with the, the mystery religions of the old world, especially Italy and Greece, the, the mysteries of Diana or Hecate. Mm -hmm. So there's a cultic religious aspect to it. But in no place could witchcraft have been really seen to be the old religion in the same way that paganism is, in that it wasn't something practiced by the people. 
You know, it was a it was a very individual craft. So your name Zell rings a bell for me. Of course, I am from Austria. I was born in Switzerland, and it sounds almost oh. like a familiar name to me. Zell. Yes. And um, so I guess your ancestors, which you are very close to, as you explained, uh, must have been from that part of the world initially. Do you, through your That's background, feel any also spiritual link to that European side of you? Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. When, when I was, uh, last time I was in, in Europe in my travels, I managed to go through the town of Zell, but it was in the middle of the night on a train, and I just saw it was there, but I didn't have a chance to have any closer connection. But that is where my ancestors on my father's side had come from mm -hmm. in Switzerland. And, um, But I haven't really felt that particular identity. I think that the that the lineage of our souls and the lineage of our flesh can be very different. Sometimes they might work closely together, but I haven't really felt that. I felt my greatest affinity in the culture and mythos was probably with the Greek traditions, although that may just because, like I said, that was some of my first exposure to the world of myth was Greek myths. I certainly felt a great connection when I was in Italy uh, with the land and the country and the of course, as I mentioned, Leonardo da Vinci in particular. But the, the Norse and Germanic traditions, while I'm, I'm familiar with them and know the stories, they haven't really called my soul in the same way. It's interesting that you say of that the lineage of our soul is different from the spirit, and I think that's very true. Two things that I would like to dig on a little bit. You said you and Lance, you founded that church to... Uh, said it in a funny way to make the world fit for people like yourself. What yes. were those people like you? How did you define yourself then and maybe still today or has that changed since then? Well, you know, uh, one of the stories that came out at that time, in addition to Strange in a Strange Land, that we really identified with was the comic book mythos of the X-Men. We sort of felt that we were mutants. In fact, the vision of the school, of Professor Xavier's school, was very much the motivation and the vision that I've held all my life for a school that I really wanted to create sometime. And that was part of our initial vision. We wanted to create not only a church, but also a school. But creating a new church was... A very big job, as it turned out, and very time-consuming, and it took a long time before we got around to the school, which I have eventually gotten around to, and the Gray School of Wizardry was really inspired initially by Professor Xavier's School for Gifted Children, and this vision that we've had all along of wanting to have a place where people who may be on the cutting edge of evolution, we, we often thought of ourselves that way. We thought we were mutants into a new stage of human and evolution. That was a very common theme, I think, there. And and I, I don't feel it was entirely too far off the mark in some ways. I think in many ways what we are building here is a new society of a whole new kind of people. Yeah. At least we hope there will be. Yeah, I hope we still have the chance to see that happen. Yes. And that brings me exactly to the second part of my question. You were mentioning science fiction and that science fiction at the time was very much an inspiration to you and people like you. And it is probably still until today for people who enter that realm a bit. But science fiction has also changed a lot today. So do you think today that is still true? Or is there other inspirations today that are stronger? Has science fiction changed? Or how do you, how do you see that today? Well, there's a marvelous book that, that addresses this question in a magnificently detailed and depth way. It's called Mutants and Mystics. And it, tra it traces the evolution of a mythos that has had its various manifestations over the ages. And I think we always regarded science fiction and, and even things like movies and comic books to be a modern mythos continuing the old myths. And the, the point of these is to provide lessons inspiration in stories that will help to shape us and guide us because the myths are created by us these stories are these are the stories that we tell we tell each other we tell ourselves but they also the myths shape us as well we are informed by these and we go forward so they shape themselves to each new era and I've always been fascinated by that I, I'm fascinated by the way that some of the old myths continue reshaping themselves how many times have we seen versions of the story of Camelot and King Arthur how many versions of the myth of Robin Hood and Hercules and 
you know, Jason and the Argonauts, and mm. so many of the great stories, they continue to be told and retold from, you know, around the campfire and songs and in, in movies and novels. And so I, I feel that we are part of this. We are part of the story. After all, stories are the only ultimate reality that survives us. That's our immortality is in the stories. As long as people keep telling stories about us, we we're, we never really die. What is remembered lives. Yeah. And the stories go on. And the stories are all about one very important thing. They're all about how do we become fully human? How do we manifest our fullest potential? What can we become if we really open it up and, and go there? You know, And these are very important questions. They concern our destiny and our future, our evolution. Where have we come from? Where are we going? And how do, can we get there? These are the big questions, and I love that stuff. <laughs> and those questions are eternal, aren't they? They are. They are. Yeah. I think Oberon's words, I just have no time to get old, are amazing. And you can feel in his voice and words the energy that makes him sound so young and passionate about the things he's telling us. Fascinating. As always, we are now going to take a short musical break before we carry on with the second part of the interview. And we return to our featured musical guest, Dave the Bard, for that. This time, I would like to play for you one of my absolute favorites by him. From his 2003 album, Hernie's Apprentice, we shall hear Obsession.
Obsession by Dave DeBard. This music and especially the lyrics, which you can find on the website, are perfectly reflecting many things that Oberon Zell has told us already and is going to tell us in the now following second half of the interview. We are speaking about deep ecology, central to his work, the magazine founded by him, Green Egg, about the Grey Council and the Grey School of Wizardry, his amazing new project, but also in a moving sequence about his great love, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, his partner, Morning Glory. Let's return to Oberon Zell. You are also an important figure in the ecological movement, I would like to call it. I was looking for the correct word. I'm maybe let's call it deep ecology. I think that's a term that's often used for it. So sure. what did bring you there at that early stage? I mean, today it's more common in our realms, let's put it that way. But at the time, it was a very new movement and also there you were a kind of pioneer how did that happen well again from my very earliest times i was very much drawn to nature and much more at home in nature than among people and stuff learning stuff about my previous incarnation is my grandfather my mother said that he used to go off on a month-long uh, camping trip every year and he would just disappear out there and and sometimes he'd bring back interesting critters there was apparently a, one time when they had a squirrel running around the house <laughs> and another one that I remember very vividly was bringing back a gigantic snapping turtle that lived in the backyard so I always had that kinship with nature and, and always felt much more at home with animals I've I've been I've worked with wildlife rescue for much of my life and have raised many wild animals, many of which I have loved dearly and cared for many of them and so on. So I've always been very immersed in that, much like Merlin in the Sword in the Stone stories with his owl. I've had a number of owls, all of which I named Archimedes after Merlin's owl. So the affinity with nature naturally brought me to mother nature, you know, to a sense of the goddess. As I learned much more about the goddess of Mother Earth in the various stories and myths, particularly Gaia in the Greek story, mm -hmm. um, I, I came to identify very strongly with her as the great mother of all mothers. In the summer of 1970, let's see, we had the first Earth Day, and the Church of All Worlds was the only church to participate in Earth Day at that particular time in St. Louis, where we were. Eventually, it got everybody got into it. Now it's almost a church thing, which is interesting. But back in that day, we were the only church that was into it because we were pagans, and we felt that made us connected. We were, paganism is nature religion. Green religion is a, is a term that I really like for it. And we really felt that. And Mother Earth is a universal concept. Everybody knows. So I, that summer, I read The White Goddess by Robert Graves and The Great Mother by Eric Newman. And both of those filled me with thoughts of the universal goddess archetype. And that fall, I had uh, a, a really remarkable experience with acid and an incredible vision of the living Earth as the entire biosphere, as a single living organism. It started just by going back through my own river of DNA in my mind, back to when it was just a single cell, a uh, single fertilized cell, mm -hmm. and then grew up from all of that to all the trillions of cells that now make up my body. And then carrying that on back, back and back through the eons and the ages, through the reproductive cycle, until eventually I got down to the very first living cell that was the ancestor of all life on Earth, what scientists now refer to as LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. Mm -hmm. which occurred somewhere about the time of the Cambrian explosion um, 544 million years ago. And, and in my vision, I went back to that single cell, and it was just like going back to the single fertilized zygote that my own present life grew from. And then I rose up above the earth and visualized this expanding and spreading and growing and multiplying and diversifying throughout all the earth as the entire living biosphere emerged in all of its myriad forms. And I saw the entire planet as one single vast living organism. And as I gazed in wonder at this incredible vision, you know, she opened her eyes, she smiled at me and she said, now you know me. 
And that was just the most profound experience of my life. Mm -hmm. And with tears squirting from my eyes, I fell to my knees and I said, I shall ever serve you. And so I, mean, I wrote this all up uh, after that. I did a huge amount of research and wrote up papers and delivered sermons and gave talks and published articles. The initial title I gave for this concept was Theogenesis, the birth of the goddess. It was those writings about this and my talks and stuff that were that galvanized the pagan movement back in that day, talking 19, early 70s. And I got my first invitation to speak at a pagan festival, a gathering, the Gnostic Aquarian Festival in Minneapolis that was sponsored by Llewellyn Publishers on Fall Equinox of 1973. And I was invited to be the keynote speaker on this subject to all these authors and luminaries. And I did. And that was where I met my beloved life mate, Morning Glory. But yeah. that's another whole yeah. story. You brought me to that story now. And if you don't mind, I would like to ask you to talk a bit about her. Because I saw that short movie that was recently published on National Geographic. And oh, yeah. I think Morning Glory was also very much at the center of that uh, short film. And oh. I was very moved by what you said and how you said it there. If you don't mind, a couple of sentences, if possible, about Morning Glory. Well, it's it's hard to even begin. She was the most incredible woman I had ever met or imagined. She was a, a, a living avatar of the goddess. Uh, mm. She was the quintessential priestess. And, you know, she, she was a ritualist. She was a singer. She was brilliant. She was a writer. She was beautiful and warm. And, and everybody who knew her, everybody who met her fell in love with her. She was just incredible and we were the perfect match the wizard and the witch for mm -hmm. 40 years that we got to share from our first meeting when we just totally just fell in love at first sight and um it was an amazing journey with incredible adventures uh, unbelievable stuff i mean we raised unicorns and dove in search of mermaids and things like that and traveled and wrote books and did Oh, so much together. Mm -hmm. And we were a pair. I, without her, I, I feel like an amputee. And she died three years ago. And she had many, many things. She had a huge community of people. We were, we were in group marriage for half of our time together. She was also a fencer and a pirate queen with the Renaissance Fair crowd. Mm -hmm. And after she died, uh, one of our friends gave her the epitaph. They said, she lived a priestess, she died a queen, and she rose a goddess. Mm -hmm. And and that is very true. I, I hear from people all the time who have her coming to them in dreams and visions, people who are calling upon her for guidance. And um, she's very busy on the other side there is the way I figure it. Right now, the last message I got <laughs> was that she's running the welcoming committee over there. And she'll keep on doing that until I show up. And then when I show up too, then we'll come back together and do it again. Thank you. Sure. Another key word in your life, green egg. Oh yes. So would you would you tell us what green egg is and how it happened and I think still lives? Yes. Well, green egg was a, another whole phenomenon. I've, I, I'm responsible for several phenomena, I guess, and that was certainly one of the great. most influential. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, Green Egg was a publication. It, it started off as a little one-page newsletter in uh, Spring Equinox of 1968. And that was why we had had that little garage sale, was to raise money so we could get a copy machine, a printer, which was a very sleazy little printer that was a, a, a ditto machine, is what they called it, mm -hmm. with four colors of ink. One was a kind of a washed-out gray that was supposed to be black, and another was a, a kind of a pale red that was kind of pinkish. And then there was a, a kind of a faded purple. And the, the last one was kind of a nice green. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, that'll be a good one to use for a color. And we, start, we said we wanted to put out a little newsletter. So what can we call it? Well, since it was going to be in green ink, and it was a, a kind of an introduction to stuff, and we had any ideas of possibilities we might want to do with it, I thought that a good name for it would be Green Egg because you don't know what is going to be coming out of that egg until it hatches, you know. <laughs> and we identified that with the earth as a green egg and so on. And 
And it started off very small, just a little one-page thing, but it grew because I would hear about some other group somewhere that was doing some kind of a pagany thing. So there was a group of druids at some college, and there was another group of people practicing Egyptian stuff somewhere else. And I'd hear about these, and I'd send them a copy of Green Egg and say, hey, guys, um, you know, you sound like pagans. Let's uh, all be pagans together and, and start a movement and join the Council of Themis. And gradually, as it grew, the Green Egg became the journal of the emerging movement. Yeah. I mean, every group had their own little newsletters and, and their own publications, but Green Egg was for everyone. Everybody wrote in to the letters. People submitted articles and, and manifestos and announcements. We published within the pages of Green Egg the newsletters of several other groups, mm -hmm. you know, just as, as an inclusion. And so we kept that going for about 10 years. But Morning Glory and I bought ourselves an old school bus and fixed it up and headed west in the summer of 1976. And Green Egg kind of languished and eventually just kind of deceased publication with, with us gone. Mm -hmm. Other people who had been working on it with us also headed west to California. So it's it sort of went into limbo for a long time, uh, 10 years. And then in 1988, after years of living out in the woods and raising unicorns and having adventures, we I found myself back in civilization again and, and got a hold of uh, an early computer uh, that was doing desktop publishing and did that for a number of years and decided that, well, maybe we should revive Green Egg. So in, mm -hmm. and in 1988, we uh, put out the first Green Egg, the next generation, number 80. And that was a big deal, and it grew hugely over the years to come. Got slick cover and, and beautiful color and won all kinds of awards and uh, just became a major publication for up until the turn of the millennium. And then the people who were involved in it couldn't do it anymore, and it kind of languished again for a few years. And the next folks that picked it up made it an online publication. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's now an online publication that you can look up in Green Egg Easing, and you can download the latest copy of it, and it continues. It's now the longest-running, continuous, uh, numbered uh, pagan publication ever since Circle ceased publishing a couple of years ago. Well, I can. Uh, you know, I'm not doing the work anymore, but I do contribute stuff. For a long time, I was the publisher and editor, but as fast as people came along that I could get trained up and pass things off to, I, I'm glad to do that because I've always got more things. Sure, and you're somebody who always needs to go on and also create new things, if I get that right. I do, I, I do. I have all these assignments lined up behind me. My life has been like, you know, that Mission Impossible thing, you know. I get this phone call, you know, hello, this is the goddess speaking, and your next assignment, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is to do some some crazy thing that I never would have thought of. And um, I learned early on that you don't really get to say, no, I think I'll sit this one out, because then they just cancel your show. <laughs> you know, the guys, the guys don't want to watch you sitting at home, you know. They want to watch you going out and doing something. <laughs> And that's so why that's why you kind of the way it's time to get old. That's exactly the reason. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm always on assignment. I'm on Her Majesty's Sacred Service. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the unicorn twice. I have to ask you to tell our listeners about the unicorn. Can't pass by that. <laughs> Well, uh, early on when Morning Glory and I got together, we discovered that among the many, many things that we shared an interest one with was a fascination with the history of mythical creatures, whether it be dragons and, and unicorns or, or Bigfoot and Loch Ness monsters and sea serpents, whatever it was. We were just fascinated by that. So, And we were fascinated by exploring the stories behind the myths and legends and trying to get at what, what was the source, what was the root of them. And we decided that we wanted to write a book on that. Peter Beagle's book, The Last Unicorn, had just come out. And it had this kind of circus um, sideshow thing called Creatures of Night Brought to Light. We thought, what a great title that would be for a book, Creatures of Night Brought to Light. So 
started doing our research over the years to come and collected big fat files and went from library to library. There was no Wikipedia in those days. There was no Google. Now it is so much easier. But in those days, you had to go to libraries, you know, and um, and we traveled around. We, we, we traveled around in the school bus that we'd fixed up and we uh, taught at colleges, things like that. And I'd always check out the libraries and see what they had on the stuff and, and copied articles and pictures. And gradually we developed files of each of these. And at some point, we came upon some stuff, obscure information about unicorns that we had pretty much dismissed as just garbled stories of rhinoceros and hadn't really explored in depth. But we came upon some research that had been done in the 1930s on horn development and relating to various known cultures and tribal peoples in Africa and Ethiopia, Nepal, who had produced uh, goats and sheep with strange horn developments, which because they had discovered a way to manipulate the proto-horn tissue in various directions. Mm -hmm. And so a researcher on this named Franklin Dove, who was a veterinarian at the Maine Research Center in in Maine in New England, did some experiments to bring all of the the enzymes that create horns. You see, people used to think that horns just grew out of the skull, so there wasn't anything you could do you could, well, about that. Or you could maybe try to transplant them, but that doesn't actually work. Mm-hmm. But before there is a horn, there are these nodes that are simply like glands that are in the skin, and they secrete enzymes after birth. And it's those enzymes that actually stimulate the horn development. So if you can manipulate where those enzymes are secreted, you can manipulate the location of the horn. And if you take uh, the, the two from both sides and bring them together into the center, when they release these enzymes, they develop a single horn that grows up right out of the center of the forehead and encompasses the sinuses up into it, vastly increasing the sense of smell, totally changes the shape of the skull and affects the brain and changes everything. And he did this experiment on a day-old Ayrshire bull calf, and it grew up to be a very powerful magnificent animal. It was intelligent and charismatic and all, but it didn't look like anybody's idea of a unicorn, unless, of course, they went back to the Bronze Age images in which the unicorns there are depicted as taurine or bull unicorns. Sure. But he didn't go into that much stuff, but, but we did, and we went, my goodness, take, let's take another look at this whole thing. And we looked at all the art we'd collected in the images, and it was pretty clear to identify, well, wait, if you look at this not as a species, but as a phenomenon that can be created or done an art form that can work with any horn species, then if you look at these pictures in that light, you see something completely different. And we saw that there were different identifiable species. And it was clear at that point that the famous European unicorn of the Renaissance tapestries and all the art there was based on a goat because it has a cloven hooves and a, and a chin, a goatee, a, a chin beard, you know. Mm-hmm. A tufted tail and all that stuff. We said, "Oh my goodness, these people, um, these were working with goats. These are caprine unicorns, and that's what's in those tapestries." Maybe we could do this. And at that time, we talked to some friends who had some property on a big, huge hippie community up in the mountains. And they said, well, we need some caretakers up there. So if you guys want to go up there and take care of the land, there's a place you can try to raise unicorns. And we did. And we did. And the first unicorns were born in the spring of 1980. And... It exploded. It became a huge worldwide sensation. We we exhibited them at every Renaissance festival in North America and eventually released a few of them to the circus, the Ringling Brothers Circus, and they yeah. took them on worldwide tour. And it was huge. It was, it was just everywhere, in magazines and newspapers and TV and books. But the remarkable thing is that these 30-some years later, the world has completely forgotten. Now, if you ask anybody, about unicorn oh no that's just a mythical beast and they have forgotten that they once walked the earth and that explains i think why unicorns have become mythologized when they're no longer physically there in the present people come to believe that they never ever existed at all but they have 
throughout history, and ours were not fake unicorns or imitation. They were the real thing. It was quite an adventure, but I, I you, know, you can read all about it in some of the books and writings and stuff. It was amazing. Yeah, I, I remember in my early 20s, uh, that was the in the early 80s, that I read about that in the magazines over here in Europe. So it was definitely quite around that story. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. I've got, I've got news clippings that are that would I would have to translate from the French or German or or Italian, you know, because uh, it was everywhere. Her Majesty's Sacred Service <laughs> brought yes. in 2002 a new idea to uh, a new step. You formed the Great Council at first and published a book. And then a couple of years later, you found it something that gives you a kind of a new title. You're being called the real Albus Dumbledore. Uh, and I'm speaking <laughs> about the Great Council and then later the Great School of Wizardry. And I just think that's a fascinating thing. But tell us about it, the Great School of Wizardry and the Great Council. That uh, is another incredible story and another one of the epic adventures of my life. It started off when I was asked to write a book by a publisher. I was introduced by a friend of mine who said, hey, Oberon, you've, you've done all this stuff and you've written all these things and you publish all this stuff. Why don't, you know, when are you going to write a book? And I said, oh, I don't know. I don't have time for that kind of stuff. And she said, well, let me introduce you to my publisher. And this was at a trade show. And so this was Trish Telesco I was talking to, who's an amazing author, has written more books than she even remembers. And so she took me over, sat me down at the booth for the New Page Publishers, and she gave this glowing introduction and told them that they really got to get a book from me. And and then uh, so they said, well, sit down. And if we were to publish a book for you, if you were going to write a book for us, what would you like to write about? And I said, well, you know, I've always wanted to have a, a manual of wizardry, like the Boy Scout handbook or the Woodchuck manual in the Donald Duck stories, you know, that would just have everything that you want to know when you're starting out, but it would be something that would be your most treasured resource for the rest of your life. And uh, so I kind of went on with this, and it had just come off the top of my head at that point. I hadn't really even thought about it before, but there it was in front of a publisher. So when people ask me a question, I got to come up with something. And she said, that sounds great. I sent us a proposal. So over the next few months, I thought about this a lot. And I talked to other people as I traveled, other people I regarded highly, uh, authors and founders of groups and so on, and and talked about this would be a really great thing to have in the world is to put out a, a grimoire for the next generation of young wizards, the kind of stuff that we would have liked to have gotten a hold of when we started on the path. And so out of that, we formed the Grey Council, which isn't exactly created in that sense. It's, there's a thing that goes on behind the scenes in the magical community from the dawn of time is this idea of a an association or a network or an invisible college kind of a is thing. Is there a reason why it's called the gray? Is, is that the color gray or is it the name or is it just something else? No, it's the color. It's definitely the color, G-R-E-Y. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and we thought that was a good one because um, other councils have had, like the one in Lord of the Rings is the White Council, for example. Yeah. But, but we felt that we didn't want to align with just black or white, that kind of a thing. And we felt that, that gray would be uh, have a lot of a white or broadness. But we also kind of jokingly said that also that describes the color of our hair. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in beards, for those of us who are old enough to be on the council, you know. So that was why we called it the Great Council. And out of that, over the next couple of years, we developed the the grimoire. I would write stuff, and people would send in stuff. We had round robin things, and I did a lot of illustrations, and we found old woodcuts and other stuff, and it was just a a project. And in the middle of it, it came to think that, well, this would be really nice to get give this foundation. And I structured it like a textbook in the form of classes and lessons and so on. And it'd be really great to then turn the readers on to some online school they can go for more study. And I know that there's lots of people doing magical schools online. And, and you know, they probably, you know, appreciate this as a textbook. And I started looking into them. 
and there weren't any that were suitable. Um, they were either seminaries teaching a particular religion, and as I mentioned before, wizardry is not a religion at all. It's beyond that. Yeah. And so we, we weren't really trying to send the readers of this book on to some funny religion, even my own, which I'm very proud of, but that wasn't the point. And also, most all of them didn't admit anybody under the age of 18, which kind of excluded what I consider to be our target audience. And the other thing was that most of them were just ridiculously expensive and we wanted to make something more available. So with all of that, it became another one of those assignments. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, and it all became a part of the emerging new Harry Potter phenomenon, which is where the interest in the market eventually came for it. So um, eventually, out of all this, we've actually founded the school, the Great School of Wizardry. And I was the headmaster, of course, as a founder. So people start referring to me as the real life Albus Dumbledore, which is certainly complimentary enough. And, and uh, it's been kind of a kick that people have referred to me at various times in my life as Merlin or Gandalf or and now <laughs> Uh, you know, Obi Wan Kenobi, because my it sounds like my name. People could say Obi Ron, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and now it's associated with. But they're all cool because the wizards and all these stories are wonderful models. They're really great, and I always identify with the wizards in the stories. You know, more than the hero. So and it's cool. how does that online school work? So you go on that website, which I will put a link on into the show notes, of course, of this podcast. Good. Good. But how do you get there? Is this a school which follows a certain curriculum or do you choose your curriculum? How does it work? Well, there are 16 departments of study. The present school is set up basically as an apprenticeship program with seven levels. And uh, we're developing a journeyman level right now, which will take it beyond that. But, but the main focus right now is on the apprentice level program. And you can choose whatever major you want of those 16 studies. If you go to the website and, and open it up, you'll see a menu that, that you can check the different departments. And you can see the syllabus of each of the classes. There's presently like 480-something classes. We have a couple dozen amazing teachers. And right now we have 380 students in 50 countries around the world. It's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. We also have a virtual school in Second Life. And if you're in Second Life, you can go check out the virtual campus as a visitor. You can't take the classes unless you sign up, but you can come and visit. Mm -hmm. And we have some days that we have special events and open house. So if you just look for great school, G-R-E-Y, on the Second Life program, you can see it that way. And it's pretty spectacular. And we have live classes there, of course. The teachers come in, world and avatars, and students will come in and sit around. We'll have a, a real-time class. And it's it's all just amazing and wonderful. I'm so proud of our students. I, I, yeah, you, you should be proud. I think this is just a very unique and amazing thing. And somehow, it's very, of course, it's very contemporary and, and very well up-to-date to what, how those things should work today. And that is a straight link to what you said about science fiction and the church that you founded many years earlier. It's modernity is still there, isn't it? It is, and it is very, very amusing to see how much in my own life it has reflected uh, the myths and stories that have inspired me. You know, in many ways, I, I grew up to become uh, the character in Stranger in a Strange Land that I was most fond of. That was Jubal Harsha, who is sort of the old wizard in that story. And I found my life becoming like that in so many ways. And now I'm the headmaster of a school to wizardry, which, you know, is like something straight out of the stories, uh, not only the Harry Potter but many other stories of wizardry that involve schools and such. So, you know, living your, your own myth, that's great because you can write your own myth, you can write your own lines, you can do stuff. What we don't really get to write in our life is whatever it is that the gods or the directors or however you think of them may decide to throw at us. Our whole thing is how do we respond? How do we react to that? The secret of the hero's myth story, you know, is that the hero is the only one in the story who doesn't have a copy of the script. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make it up as we go along. I have a final question for you, Oberon. Um, and I'm afraid it's not an easy one because uh, it brings us back to the ecological movement and to the earth and to nature and all that. I think our 
world is not in extremely good shape regarding that. Maybe the world and Gaia will respond to that eventually, but how would you suggest or how would you counsel us that we should look for the future, that we should make this world a better world, our nature live again in a better way and not abusing it as so many of us do nowadays? Ah, uh, well, you know, uh, there are big, huge things that, that just look very daunting in the world, like, you know, global warming and and deforestation and stuff. But individually, we can each have our own part. We can try to live lightly on the earth. We can reduce our consumption of um, things like meat and sugar and other stuff that is not really healthy for ourselves or the planet. Certainly, the uh, meat industry is a huge thing to address. Um, it's just, just enormous. There are answers and antidotes to these. My water brother, Lance Christie, his major life work was the Renewable Deal, which is the product of the Association for the Tree of Life, which looked at all the different problems in the world and came up with a prescription of how these can be addressed. And that was his dedication and work. And they cover everything from uh, replacing paper and textiles and uh, wood with hemp and bamboo products, for example, to mm -hmm. uh, to different energy systems and such, like you know hydrogen and solar and wind and all that stuff we know about. But there are just many ways. Each of us in our own lives just have to find ways that we can live better and lighter and take care of each other better and of the earth. Plant trees. We've planted thousands of trees. That's, that's a really pretty straightforward thing to go. The forestry department will give you seedlings that you can go and plant on in areas that have been deforested or areas you want to develop, and you can have tree planting parties. We yeah. still do that every year at, um, at New Year's. We, we have a big tree planting event, and we've reforested vast amounts of destroyed areas. So that, that's a wonderful, fun thing people can do. Yeah. Uh, adopt a highway and, and have your group uh, go out and clean up the highway along there. Look at these kind of things. Uh, work with critter care. You know, yeah. that kind of stuff. As you say, each one has to do it individually on exactly and not talk about the others what they don't do. Right. Oberon, anything that we missed out on, anything that is important to you and we didn't talk about or anything that you would like to add? <laughs> oh, my goodness. There are so many things we could talk about. But, you know, I think I would like to leave everybody with what the most important piece of wisdom, what I feel is the essence of the ancient wisdoms and the ancient wisdom teachings, and it's the motto of the Gray School, and that is everything is alive and everything is interconnected. As long as we remember that and that we're all children of the same mother, I think we'll be going forth with the right attitude. I think nothing more to add to that. Oberon Zell, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a very interesting and a very inspiring hour for me and I'm sure also for our listeners. Thank you for sharing that with us and I hope we will speak to you again at some point. Well, you're welcome, Rudolf. It was a pleasure, Rudolf. I thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. Blessed be. What an amazing and impressive man. And if you have seen him on a photo, you will also be impressed. There is more than the reason of his school of wizardry that he is compared to Dumbledore. You'll see that. It was a great pleasure to talk to Oberon and very inspiring. I hope you enjoyed listening to him just as much. In the intro of today's episode, I promised you another interview. And here we go. I was able to meet with our featured musician of this episode, Dave DeBart, online for a short interview, and I'm very happy to be able to share that with you. Dave tells you about how he became a musician, what music and especially his music mean to him, the background of his work rooted in his country, and last but not least, he teaches me how to properly pronounce his name. And I'm not sure I will ever learn it. Here comes Dave the Bard. 
Welcome, Dave, on the Thoth Hermes podcast for this short interview. We just listened to already two pieces of your music. A third is still to come in this episode. Thank you for meeting us. Thank you for inviting me on your show. It's lovely to speak to you. You know, I've been a long-standing fan of your show, of your uh, Druid podcast, which I'm <laughs> listening to very regularly. I can only advise my listeners to go to that show as well, which I'm sure they have already done anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you. Today we talk about one of your many facets, which is the musical side. Mm. If I read your short biography that I found online well, music has been a part of your life from your very use, correct? Absolutely. Music was my first love. You know, when I was very young, most of my friends went to football. I was never into football. Uh, I was always into music. When when they were swapping, I don't know, those old football cards that you used to swap to get full teams in, in playgrounds and things, I, I never bought any of those. I was always listening to music. Music was the thing that moved my soul. And I, I sang at the top of my voice on my rocking horse, much to the love of my parents and the horror of my neighbors <laughs> <laughs> and my dream was to learn how to play actually it was the bass the bass was what i wanted to learn but my dad and he he's not a musician but he gave me this amazing piece of advice he said if you learn how to play the six string you'll never be without an income and you'll never be without friends mm -hmm. Now, he didn't really know that, but he, he was absolutely right. And he said, and if you learn the six string, you'll probably be able to play the bass as well. So I got my first, I asked for my first guitar, got my first guitar when I was eight years old and uh, just always, always dreamt that I would earn my living through my music. And I told all my teachers, don't worry, I don't need qualifications. I'm going to be a musician. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about me. It'll all be fine. It'll all be fine. And uh, finally it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think one of your, to me, famous teachers was Tim O'Leary, the mm -hmm. Irish guitar player, I think. Oh, well, no. he played many yep. instruments, if I remember well. He, yes, he was a multi-instrumentalist. In fact, he built his own harp when I was his student. In my, um, When I was about 12, he was building a, a Celtic harp with full-on dragon carved Uh, head and everything he played the bazooki he played the mandolin he, you know and he couldn't read music for years that was the thing he i was his first student and and he taught me by ear he would play a g chord he would get me to close my eyes and hear the g chord the sound mm -hmm. how does that make you feel okay here's a c chord can you hear is that higher or lower than the g chord you know what's the relationship between the c and the g chord that's how he taught me mm -hmm. and i I still can't read music and sometimes really? i think i'm at, no no i can't read a note i have no idea how music works on a technical level i have no idea how it all works i just know through what tim taught me when i was a kid how it makes me feel and how the sounds and the chords and the melodies work together on a kind of emotional level rather than an intellectual one but you also have become a kind of multi-instrumentalist you play the six string the eight string the four string <laughs> Yeah, yes. I mean, that was part of what my dad said. You know, he said, learn the six string and you can, you'll, you'll be able to learn the bass guitar. But actually, if you can play the guitar, then, you know, it's not that difficult to, to step into a bazooki or a mandolin or a 12 string or a sitern or, or any of those other kind of instruments. I mean, where I fall to the ground are things like the violin. Whenever I try to learn the violin, it, it just sounds like I'm trying to kill something. It's terrible. So, and and it's, a, it's a screwed up instrument anyway. I mean, I, I love it when it's played well, but who thought of putting something under your chin and then put, bowing it instead of picking it with a finger? You know? And I think, I think part of that was Tim's influence as well as I saw that he could play so many instruments and Mike Oldfield as well was a big influence on that one because I saw him on an old program when I was a kid called Blue Peter mm -hmm. and and he he basically did the Blue Peter theme tune all by himself multi-tracking and and I, I thought even then oh I could probably do that and that's exactly how I record my albums now you know I just yeah. multi-track myself playing all the different instruments all the different voices and that's it yeah that's amazing I mean We mm. just heard a piece of your amazing music. I love that type, of course, that you are today on this show after the interview with Oberon Zell. It's not a pure coincidence because <laughs> uh, your music, how would yeah. you call it? 
I would call it mystic folk, I would think, is probably a good term to use it, because I'm not sure it fits in the Celtic music, because Mm. it's not kind of that ilk of the Planksty, Scottish type thing. Not all of the time, anyway. Mm. But it's it's definitely acoustic folk music with a mystical edge to the to the vocals and the and the lyrics and the content. So, you know, I've always said it's mystic folk. I'm not even sure if that's a genre, but I've made it up anyway. Well, it's your, it's your <laughs> genre. Your personal background, is it Celtic as well? Or? I was born in Cornwall, which if you look at the kind of Celtic countries, that is considered to be one of them. But we moved away. We moved away from Cornwall when I was very young and I had asthma when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And my parents were advised to move away from Cornwall because of the damp air. And they came up to Sussex when I was very young and I've lived here all my life. I've always thought that I'm an island dweller. I live on an island. I live on Albion. I may be biased, but one of the most beautiful islands in, in on the whole of this planet you know and so i don't necessarily apart from human culture and things like that i when i cross the border from cornwall to england or wales to england or whatever it's just a beautiful beautiful lump of rock sticking out of the atlantic ocean you know to me and 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 i live on an island i'm a briton that gave me a perfect cue you were mentioning Albion, uh-huh. of course and i think it was one of the cds also that is named spirit of albion and we just That's listened right. to that piece yes so talk to us a bit about your music let's take that piece as an example sure well spirit of albion the song is an adoration praise song of of this island that i'm living on it's not necessarily about the people or about any kind of bloodline or anything like that it's about the land itself it's saying you know from from manoethan's crashing sea to the moor and the highland glen from the fairy hills home of the she to the veins of the broad and the fen everywhere all over this country it's like saying it's an adoration song for the land you know and that's that's what it is to me and albion is one of the oldest names that we know of for britain well really if you listeners have not yet discovered the music of dan de bard do i pronounce that correctly Help. it's a, well okay so d-a-m-h is the the m-h sound in gaelic and it's a gaelic word is yeah. the So D-A-M-H, it means stag, which is my animal, but it also means bard. So and it's officially it's it's pronounced Darv D A R V Darv, but my name is Dave, so I just literally use D A M H as my spelling of Dave the Bard. But there's there's also a kind of edge of of magic in there as well, with the meaning of the word. So actually, I'm Bard the Bard, bard. (laughs) or Stag Stag the Bard, or Dave the Bard. Yeah. But thank you for educating me. I didn't know that. That's Um, all right. If the listeners have not yet discovered your music, I don't believe there are many who have not. Go to the show notes and I will put all the links to your website, to your music there. And please do discover. Uh, Dave, uh, what is your next project music-wise? Is there any CD out there coming up to us? There is. I've just literally put the finishing touches on the whole audio to a new double album that will be out at the Autumn Equinox Court. And um, and this album is quite different. It actually contains storytelling as well. And it's a storytelling or, and re, retelling with music and song and poetry and story of the entire first branch of an old book from Wales called The Mabinogion. It's a double album. It's I mean, it's hard to sum it up in a very brief amount of time, but yeah, it will be out at the autumn equinox. So if if that kind of thing, if you're into old myths being told in a very bardic manner, uh, have a listen. Come along to the website and I'll I'll have some some clips on the front page for you to hear. Great. That's very interesting. And I will also try to put that for autumn equinox back on the website to remind our listeners that thank they you will find it well dave thanks so much for that short glimpse on your work of course what you are doing is much more than music if one can do more than music at all <laughs> And I'm happy to tell our listeners also that we will have you back for an extensive interview this time for a 
featured interview in one of the upcoming episodes, probably in January. Well, I wish you until then a good time and blessed be, as we say. Thank you for inviting me onto the show. And uh, yeah, we'll speak again in 2018. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. You. Blessed be. Thank you. Many thanks, Dave. I find it always very interesting to talk to the people who make music. It gives me a completely new perspective when I then listen to their music. And to keep the impression of what he had to say to us about the spirit of Albion, I will immediately continue and play for you the set piece. Spirit of Albion, from the album with the same name, issued in 2006. Dave 
the Bard, Spirit of Albion, and I think we could really feel the love for the rock he lives on, as he put it in the interview. I might also mention that Dave is an important member of the esoteric community and a leading member of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids in England. And, as you heard before, he will be a guest early next year on this podcast about those topics. The News Many of you have probably already come across the name of Quareya. I'm sure I mentioned it sometime here on this show, and some of you have probably also heard the interview with Josephine McCarthy and Michael Shepard about Quareya on the Great Occult of Personality podcast, where I have the honor to be the co-host of my friend Greg Kaminsky. Quareya is a project led by British magician and occultist Josephine McCarthy. It calls itself a new school of magic for the 21st century. In 240 lessons that you can download for free from their website, spread over three sections, Apprentice, Initiate and Adept, it proposes an in-depth magical course that will take you years to work through if you take it seriously. And you should take it seriously. I will talk more about Korea in a future episode. But now, they have also made the course available for those who prefer a book rather than a computer screen or a printout on single sheets. In fact, it is three books and one for each section, with over 700 pages for the first two and over 900 for the third. And it is worth every cent, so much I can say. This news item is a kind of intermediate thing between news and the review, because I would like to read to you what a Facebook friend of mine, Christoph D. Grafenried, wrote today on Facebook. Christoph knows what he's talking about. He has 30 plus years of magical practice. Here he goes. Just got my copy of the huge volume that is Quaria Apprentice Training Manual. Though this hardcover edition contains all the apprentice level training that is available for free from the Quaria website, the hardcover format offers a different and, in my opinion, a superior reading experience. It is a hardcover book, so I consider all contrary arguments to be invalid. This book is the first of three giant volumes penned by Josephine McCarthy that include apprentice, initiate and adept levels of training. Relying heavily, as the training does, on visionary magic, experiencing real-time gnosis via one's work in astral imaginal space, the education presented in these volumes may strike many traditionally trained magicians witches, sorcerers, etc., as being somewhat different than what is normally presented, especially at beginning levels. It is not the familiar basics that aren't covered. They are. It is what is added in terms of perspective and practices that reflect a magical mindset or paradigm that is far more trusting of the integrity of one's inner own experience than other magical educations might be. Of course, there are rituals, but there is significantly more than that going on in these volumes. This is book magic insofar as one is self-educating in these practices via books. But the magic thought within these pages is presented in a manner that is designed to aid the occultist in seeing in such a way that one is able to jailbreak, to use a Gordon Whiteism when used in a magical context, and work within other systems as one so chooses. Thus, one may be a witch, shamanic practitioner, a pagan priestess, magician or sorcerer, 
and still benefit from this excellent, thoroughly detailed, comprehensive and well-written volumes of magical education. Naturally, if one is coming from a very particular paradigm, one may find one's assumptions challenged, but I find that to be a good thing overall. However, to be honest, I had more aha moments, more moments of, yep, I've been thinking this for the last two decades, than I have with any magical training to date. Thanks, Christoph. You said it all. And you, dear friends and listeners, will find the links to both the Quaraya site and the books to buy on the website in the news section. Books and other reviews. Going Beyond the Little White Book is the title of a book by Liz Worth, published through Lulu a little less than a year ago. The subtitle tells you more clearly what Liz wants to tell us. A Contemporary Guide to Tarot. The little white book that is mentioned in the title means those tiny, oft badly printed and if at all bound booklets that you get when you buy a new tarot deck. Well, here we get the rather big book with over 350 pages, we should be able to answer you probably most of the questions you have about the tarot cards, if that is at all possible. Another book on the tarot, you might ask. So, what is the purpose of this one? Why should you get it? Is it for me? I think the answer is partly stated in the mentioned subtitle. This book brings a very concise and modern approach to the tarot. It is probably the book you have been waiting for if you want a wide and thorough introduction into what the tarot cards can give you today. Card by card, Arcana and other cards. Lisworth explains meanings in different situations of modern life, gives you a mantra for each of the 72 cards, the intention of each card and the lengthy interpretation of its significance. This will not be your only book about the tarot. If you want to learn about different spreads, about the history of the tarot, etc., etc., you will need to buy more books because Going Beyond the Little White Book does not offer you that. It sticks exactly to what its title says. It is the book that will extend the little white book of your deck so much that you afterwards will know how to deal with the deck and you will probably have become curious and knowledgeable enough to search further for your next step with the Book of Thoughts, as the tarot is also called. Liz Worth is herself a professional tarot reader and astrologer. I think that her book is a very good starting point for many beginners, but can also be interesting to the more experienced tarot reader to get a broad view on meanings and significances. Therefore, recommend it. You will find the link to where you can get this book on the website. This brings us to the end of today's episode number 10. I'm happy that I could kind of catch up a bit with the backlist of to-dos I had. It was, as always, a great pleasure for me to produce this show for you, and I want to thank all those who have helped and contributed to it. Next time, we will meet again in episode number 11 on September 14. And our guest then will be another of the great men who have created the occult environment we all work in today. Carol Pogue Runyon, also known as Frater Tabion, host of the great show The Hermetic Hour, founder of the Church of Hermetic Sciences and the Ordo Templis Astartes. Don't miss that one. And now I will ask Wendy Rule to start with her wonderful song Night Sea Journey. 
and to give us the usual farewell from the episode. I hope you have enjoyed yourselves, maybe learned something new, and well, in any case, I did. Looking forward to welcoming you back next time. Take care, stay tuned, hear you soon. Yeah, so